Namaste. So now we come to the 10th Sutra. And this is very interesting because it exposes the point of view of the most enlightened people, which is called Ajatavada, the view that the world is unborn, Ajata. Devotee, if the entire universe is of the form of mind, then does it not follow that the universe is an illusion? If that be the case, why is the creation of the universe mentioned in the Veda? Maharshi, there is no doubt whatsoever that the universe is the merest illusion. The principal purport of the Veda is to make known the true Brahman after showing the apparent universe to be false. It is for this purpose that the Vedas admit the creation of the world and not for any other reason. Moreover, for the less qualified persons, creation is taught, that is, the phased evolution of Prakriti, primal nature, Mahatattva, the great intellect, Tanmatras, the subtle essences, Bhutas, the gross elements, the world, the body, etc., from Brahman. While for the more qualified, Simultaneous creation is taught, that is, that this world arose like a dream on account of one's own thoughts induced by the defect of not knowing oneself as the self. Thus, from the fact that the creation of the world has been described in different ways, it is clear that the purport of the Vedas rests only in teaching the true nature of Brahman, after showing, somehow or other, the illusory nature of the universe. That the world is illusory, everyone can directly know in the state of realization, which is in the form of experience of one's bliss nature. So this is the reality. Huh? The material world is false. Brahman is the truth. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mitya. This is the famous aphorism by Shankaracharya. Brahman is truth. Jagat, the creation of many objects, is false, Mitya, which just means the same as Maya. It doesn't really exist. So, of course, when one first hears this, it sounds very strange. The world is real, he thinks. You know, if I bang on the wall, I hurt my hand. <laughs> it's real. So Ramana says, the Vedas then teach the process of creation. That this comes from that, and that comes from this, and so on and so on, as a stepwise evolution of material energy. And we've gone over that in great detail in Lakshmi Tantra and in some of the other books that we've profiled on this channel. But he says the reason for doing so is to then show that this creation is false. For example, Uladu Narpadu, the famous 40 verses on reality, begins with the statement, because we see the world, then we have to uh, basically create a creator to explain its existence. So this is exactly what the Vedas do. They meet us halfway. Instead of saying immediately that Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya, the Vedas say, yes, there's this creation, and there is an Ishwara, there's a supreme controller, and there are various subsidiary controllers, different gods and demigods and so on. 
and that they together create this world and manage it. And at the end, they wind it up and it disappears. Because this is what we experience. We see every material object has a beginning, a middle and an end. No exceptions. Everything that we can see is like that. The only thing that doesn't change is the seer. And this is the truth that Ramana is aiming at here. A long time ago, or not so long ago, we did a series on Drig Drishya Vivekaha, which is exactly about this. It means discrimination between the seer and the seen. But in the beginning, this is not possible. It's not intuitively obvious to the casual observer, as the saying goes. So the Vedas then uh, propagate the illusion of duality, that there's a creator and a created world. And this is explained in great detail in various scriptures. Why is that? Because if their creation is real, then there has to be a creator. And so the Vedas initiate this search for the creator, for the source. And it goes through many phases which we have documented in our good old diagram of the four states of different consciousness and different yogas that are associated with it. And ultimately, we have to understand the Creator is our Self, with a capital S. And that the empirical Self, the small s, <laughs> Self, is one of the created things. It's fabricated. It's made up basically out of nothing. And that this illusion in some total is called the world. So if we are in the lowest state of consciousness, Jagrat, or even lower, animal consciousness, <laughs> as a Pashu, an animal-like human being, we think the world is real, and that's where we usually start in life. But there are very deep problems with this. If the world is real, if it's a creation, where is the creator? You can look high and low, but you won't find any evidence of a creator. The poor scientists <laughs> banging their heads against the wall trying to come up with some explanation. And the best they can do is that, it, oh, it's all random chance. That's crazy. The scientists themselves use their intelligence to build very sophisticated machines for investigating the reality. So if it requires intelligence to build a, a tokamak or a large hadron collider, or whatever our the machine du jour might be, <laughs> the James Webb Space Telescope, whatever, then certainly it must take greater intelligence to build something like this universe. Where is that intelligence? Can we find it anywhere? No because we're looking in the wrong way. We're looking for the wrong thing. The idea or the image of a human-like God, an omnipotent creator, is basically a projection. It's an anthropomorphic metaphor. Huh? You ready for some big words? <laughs> It's an epistemological fabrication. <laughs> In other words, it's imaginary. But we have to do that in the lower states of consciousness because we literally can't imagine any other way. 
Nature is certainly powerful, at least in terms of creating the world. But nature is not human. Nature is beyond human. But our tiny intelligence can't grasp that. So we create a human image and project that on nature. And this is the goddess or God, depending on our preferences. <laughs> but those are mainly aesthetics. The fact is, the world cannot exist without a creator. So at first, the Vedas teach gradual step-by-step -step creation by various gods, only to tear down the whole edifice in the higher teachings of Advaita and show that actually it's the self that creates everything and that the universe only seems to exist because we have forgotten who we really are. Uh, because we see the world, uh, the whole edifice of religion, of Vedic truth, has to be built. And if it's not the Vedas, it's some other scripture. But the message is the same. The world seems to exist, but ultimately it's simply a projection. Why do we project the world? because we have a desire to exist as an individual, to be separate from everything else. This is our disease. This is our mental disability, our ignorance, our delusion, the Buddha says. He says there's a threefold ignorance, desire, aversion, and delusion. And the delusion is principally that we want to exist as an individual. We want to be separate. This is called egotism, ahankar, false ego, false identity, false worship of a false God, which we create. Now, this is not to say that we advocate atheism. We don't. But for people on a lower level of realization, the uh, theological superstructure is absolutely necessary. Otherwise, they could slide into atheism and disbelieve in everything, and that would be a disaster. Well, it's happening. Look at the world. Look at the people around you. They deny God using the excuse of science, so-called. <laughs> but science isn't really very scientific. <laughs> they claim to be empirical. But who of them has empirical evidence of the Big Bang? Or who has evidence that consciousness arises from brain function? These are mere theories, postulates. They can never be proved. Even the scientists themselves are conscious, but they categorically deny all subjective experience. Why is that? Because they can tell that they are in illusion, that their testimony, their observations can't be trusted, that the senses are limited and defective. And so the evidence produced by them is also bogus and leads to wrong conclusions. This has been demonstrated time and time again. Yet, they persist in believing in their theories. <laughs> and they go on and on theorizing about things that are completely unprovable by nature. Because we can never go back in the past and observe the Big Bang. But we can go within ourselves and observe how every day when we wake up from sleep, the world comes into existence again. It's simply 
a long-standing dream. Huh? Just like last night, I was dreaming of riding a motorcycle in the rain. And it was fun. Then I woke up, and it was 3 o'clock, and I had left the fan on. <laughs> so my body was cold. See? We create the world in our dreams according to our various illusions. And then when we so-called wake up, we find the same kind of world is there, just more persistent, that's all. But it's equally illusory, it's equally a dream, because it disappears every night when we go to sleep. This is the actual reality. This is everyone's experience. This is easily provable by empirical observation. And that even the mind disappears in deep sleep. So what is left? Only consciousness. Only pure awareness. Awareness of awareness. Turiya. This is the actual nature of reality. And this is the complete enlightenment. Aum Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung.